listen. Um, this will be the second of four on this topic, actually, uh, covering Romans 5:12 on through as as far as we get. Um, I'm going to start with a little review. We read in in Romans chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, to close yesterday, and I'll read those now. Um, but just remember that this is uh, we we emphasize that uh, this is a separate but related uh, mystery that the Lord revealed to Paul about Israel's blindness coming blindness uh, at the time it was coming it's it's there now and when it will end uh, it's revealed <clears throat> Romans 11:25. for I would not brethren that you should be ignorant of this mystery lest you should be wise in your own conceits that and here's the mystery blindness in part is happened to Israel and uh, we noted that it doesn't say blindness has happened to Israel in part, or blindness has happened in part to Israel, or to part of Israel. It says it, it's the blindness that's partial. At that time, it became full at a, at a later time, but for I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until, so there's going to be an end to it, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. But in, in uh, Romans 11.26, the secret is further revealed that afterward, so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So, um, well, after that, the fulfillment of Israel's prophecies start up again. Um, <clears throat> in the meantime, there's a vacancy. Israel has fallen, been cast away. And as uh, Isaiah 6 says, there are, have been centuries of desolation in the land that God had designated as his seat, his, uh, w from where he will rule the world for a thousand years. So Israel's prophet Ezekiel foretells that uh, Israel's day will come. Look in Ezekiel 36, starting in verse 21. But I had pity, this is God speaking to, uh, through the prophet to Israel. But I had pity for mine holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. Verse 22. Therefore, say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake which you have profaned among the, the heathen, whither you went. Verse 23, And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which you have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. This is obviously still prophecy. Uh, this, uh, excuse me, this is still prophecy. Uh, verse 24, For I will take you from among the heathen, and gather you out of all the countries, and will bring you into your own land. 25, Then will I sprinkle you, uh, excuse me, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I clean, cleanse you. Verse 26. So, well, before we go to 26, he's going to sprinkle them with clean water after he brings them to their land. Verse 26. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh 
and will give you a heart of flesh. Verse 27, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you shall keep my judgments and do them. 28, and you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. I also, I will also save you from all your uncleanness, and I will call for the corn, and will increase it, and lay no famine upon you. There will be plenty, in other words. <coughs> So he's uh, he's gonna gonna make all these things come true, that all the promises that uh, seem to have failed when, well, through all those years of the kings in Israel in the Old Testament, and and uh, as you know at the coming of Jesus Christ and his uh, crucifixion, uh, if if you just looked at it from a, a human viewpoint, it looks like a lot of failures in a row there. The Lord is going to make all his promises come true. There will come a time that he will exercise his power. And part of that is pouring out on Israel a spirit of grace and of supplication and changing their heart, as we just read. But Israel's good intentions of being righteous on their own, by their own works, it didn't work out. They found out that they're pledged to keep every one of God's laws, Deuteronomy 6.25, was impossible to do, as God designed it to show them that they needed a Savior. So one day, Israel will have God's righteousness, God's righteousness. And we're familiar with that. God has done that for us believers in Paul's gospel today. But Israel does not believe they're sinners. They believe they're privileged. And uh, there will come a time that they, God will pour out his grace on them and they will understand and, and uh, mourn for him whom they've pierced. One day Israel will have God's righteousness and as uh, Romans 11.25 says, the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And after that, uh, Israel's blindness will be ended. Uh, I should have read the whole verse. Uh, in fact, let me just get that. I don't have it in my notes here. 11.25 For I would not... Well, let me put it there for you guys, too. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness, in part, is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. They're not come in yet. Not the fullness of them. Israel is still blinded. Try to talk to uh, well, <laughs> uh, All right, let's go on. Uh, I wanted to read Psalm 32, 6. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come, they shall not come nigh unto him. So Israel's good intentions didn't work out. They found out they couldn't keep the law. So one day Israel's righteousness, let me get this uh, series here in Hosea we want to read. Um, the verse after the one that we read there, Isaiah, uh, Romans 11.25, says that Israel will be saved eventually. Uh, if you look at Paul's gospel, we are saved now. We, uh, uh, we that believe that Christ died for my sins, that, that clears me of guilt if Christ already paid the penalty for my sins. And it frees me to do godly things. To uh, He puts his spirit within me, including his will. Uh, I don't want to. <laughs> well, read, read Romans 6 and 7. And that's what we're heading toward in these, these uh, studies. And it'll be 12 lessons before we get through all of that. But uh, 
so Israel, all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And you can see that in the prophets. Hosea 1, 9, 10, and 11. Then said God, call his no name, Lo am I, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sun, sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, You're not my people. There it shall be said unto them, You are the sons of the living God. Verse 11, Then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. And the verse we alluded to before, Zechariah 12, verses 9, 10, and 11, and it shall come to pass, this is to, to illustrate the, uh, that Israel will have a future uh, after the fullness of the Gentiles come in into what God is building today. What's God building today? What is, what is uh, what are believers in today's gospel that Paul preached, what are we being put into? We're, we're being placed in, baptized by one spirit into the body of Christ. There we go. That's it. Good. Thank you. Um, Zechariah 12, 9 through 11, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him, as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day there shall be great mourning in Jerusalem, as the mourning of Hadadrinim in the valley of Megiddo. Well, that's a different thing. That's not the same as being given, the, given God's righteousness and never having any sins on our account anymore uh, on that basis because God forgave all the sins already and imputed his righteousness to us. It's in our account. It's, it's <laughs> by his doing, not ours. Uh, you can't undo it. <laughs> uh, you see, one is, one way is, is, believing Paul's gospel, and the other is keeping the covenant that Israel had made with God, or rather God had made with Israel, that they must not sin. And Israel had agreed to the covenants and the law in Deuteronomy 6.25 here. Uh, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these, com all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he hath commanded us. So they had high hopes of living a perfect life, but they found out that because of sin in mankind, uh, uh, the law works wrath. Romans 4.15, Because the law worketh wrath, for where, there, where no law is, there's no transgression. In other words, no transgression of the law. You, can, you can't cross over and get on the wrong side of it when there is no law. Romans 3 kind of uh, brings that out, I think, a little better. Romans 3, uh, 19 to 22. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God, and we mentioned yesterday that uh, the Gentiles had been guilty before God ever since Romans 1, uh, the first chapter there, verses 20, 23 through 28 or so, through the end of the chapter, 
uh, the Gentiles were already guilty before God. And here it says, uh, the things that the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. Not just the Gentiles, in other words, the Jews too that had the law. And all the world may become guilty before God. All of it. All the world. Verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Not curing of, <laughs> curing of the penalty or whatever. Not, not fixing what needs to be fixed because of the law. It, it, gives you, it makes you aware that you're a sinner. Verse 21, but now, but now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In other words, the law says, this is what's right, the law. And the prophets call the people back uh, from their idolatry and apostasy. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, Who's it unto? It's, it's unto all. But who's it upon? It's upon all them that believe. So, God, God is finished. Not yet. When he is finished building the church, which is his body, he will catch us up to be with him. And then he will also enable Israel to receive God's spirit and imputed righteousness. For us, the gift of righteousness is, as it said in Romans uh, 5.17, where we, we had gotten up to 5.17 yesterday, for by one man's offense, death reigned by one. Much more, they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Christ, uh, Jesus Christ. That's what we're to do, is to receive the abundance of grace that God pours out on us and the gift of righteousness. When, when he poured it out at the cross, his grace, um, the blood of the cross is what reconciles us to the Lord. So, having been given righteousness, God's righteousness, we've been given a reigning life here. Reigning, not... <laughs> It's going to rain today, but uh, reigning over life. <coughs> and that's, that's this life here. It's not talking about after the resurrection. It's talking about having a life here that's characterized by this righteousness of God that's in us, imputed to us. Now that that's not all. Uh, that's not all there is. Uh, we believers have God's righteousness. We're dead to sin. We're told in Colossians 3, 5, mortify, therefore, in your members upon, uh, which are upon the earth. He gives a list of things, uh, the sins of the fleshly deeds. Fleshly deeds, uh, things, uh, works that do not come from the Spirit of God within us. Or from the gift of righteousness that's within us by faith. What we started out here, uh, <laughs> what we started out with was that the gift of righteousness is part of the formerly hidden mystery that we're involved in and that Christ has announced through Paul. It's different from Israel's doctrine, from Israel's gospel, from Israel's covenants. It's unrelated. I shouldn't say that. It's the same Savior, but it's a different, it's, it's different words. You can tell they're different doctrines, different uh, gospels. So going on to the next verse in Romans 5, we're at verse 18, and it says, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Uh, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. And 
as we read in, in Romans 3, verses 21 and 22, read it a few minutes ago, it's available to all. And that justification of life is by faith, by trusting, by, by faith. Uh, Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Not through our works, not through being steadfast, uh, it's through Jesus Christ and the riches of his grace. So faith is required. It's, it's required. Well, it, it required Christ's faith to go to the church, to the cross. But it requires our trusting in the gospel of Christ, believing and receiving to ourselves that Christ died for our sins, that Christ made faith full payment for your sins and my sins. By believing that, we're saved and ju we're justified. Romans 5.18, uh, it says justified. The free gift came upon all men unto justification of life, which is seen to be by faith, trusting in... <coughs> Uh, excuse me. Uh, trusting in, in uh, what we're told in, in uh, Ephesians 1.13, in whom you also trusted. After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. There is one principle here we need to remember. The Bible doesn't explain everything every time it mentions a topic. It does explain it thoroughly throughout the Bible, but it, it can refer to salvation without giving the full gospel every time. We can see in Ephesians 1.13 that the word of truth is the same as the gospel of your salvation. The way it's worded, it tells us that. In the same way, we know something from 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2, the first two verses there. Uh, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. So he says, I declare it to you. I'm telling it to you. He had told them before in, in Corinth. He's telling them in writing. And here it is, which, which also you have received. The believer receives the gospel. He not only believes it, he believes it to himself, takes it into him, into his need, his need for a savior, for salvation. So it's uh, similar to what it says in, in Ephesians 1.13, that after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So it's equating those two. The gospel of your salvation is the word of truth. It's called the word of truth because it is. It's a restatement of the same thing. It's not a series of things. It, it's a statement that the gospel of your salvation is the word of truth. Well, it's the same thing in 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you received, wherein you stand, by which also you are saved. Those three things. They receive it, stand in it, and they're saved by it. By the gospel. Paul's gospel. Not Israel's gospel and covenants. Nothing about that in here. He goes on at the end of uh, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 2 to say that unless you believed in vain, in other words, take Paul's whole gospel, his whole doctrine, his whole teaching, and see that through his, throughout his teaching, he teaches salvation by God's grace through faith that Christ died for your sins. That frees you. Uh, the penalty's paid. There's no, you're not bound anymore if you believe. And that's the condition. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. 
But Paul specifies to believe what he preached unto them as opposed to what Peter or James or John preached. Um, he says, keep in memory what I preached unto you. So Paul is saying that there is an important difference between his and their Gospels. There's an important difference there between Israel's Gospel and Paul's later Gospel. Paul is defining the division here, the division that needs to be rightly divided. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, 2, Keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. Uh, you, unless you have believed in vain. So it's vain and futile to believe any other gospel than Paul's gospel. But what we need to see here at the end of verse 2, Paul uses a slightly different word to refer back to what he called received in verse 1. And it's as if you were coaching your son or a child <laughs> how to hit a baseball. And you say, well, when they pitch the ball to you, hit the ball, really smash it. Well, the word smash is not defined just exactly like the word hit. But both words are referring to the same event. They both mean to swing the bat so as to contact the ball as it's coming to you. And uh, hits the bat in a severe way and, and causes the ball to rapidly go flying out of there. So... Uh, Paul is giving additional information as to what that shift of trust that must occur, what, what it is shifting from the person managing their own results of God's judgment against them, shifting to the person fully depending on Christ to manage the results of God's judgment that had been against them. So, on unless you believed in vain it says it it's it takes belief and that's what paul is saying verses uh verse 2 uh, where it says belief that's equated with receiving in verse 1 he goes on to say in verses 3 and 4 here here are the facts of the gospel that are to be believed that he was talking about receiving in order to be saved. Here they are. Uh, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and then he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. So when you believe that when Christ died on the cross, he was dying for your sins in your place, so that you won't die that way, when you believe that, it's the same as saying you have received that good news to yourself. So you see that re, uh, believing that, that Christ died for your sins is more than just a mental, mentally knowing a fact that he died for your sins. It's receiving it to yourself. It's saying, I have a need uh, that I can't fix. Christ died to fix that need. I trust him to have done it sufficiently. Christ died for my sins, and he gave me his righteousness. It's receiving it to yourself. Christ offers uh, to trade places with you. Look at Second. Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, him who knew no sin, no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And it's fully knowing that Christ actually will trade places with you and that he will completely accomplish your salvation forever in spite of you. <laughs> uh, it's it's all that event back there at the cross, but 
the transaction happens when you believe it. So let's continue in 1 Corinthians 15, 3. For I delivered unto you that, uh, uh, I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. So Paul did. Paul received it. It's that word again. It's the word uh, received. Uh, it's what Paul did when he believed the gospel on the Damascus Road. He received and believed. Otherwise, he would have been, uh, what, straightened out some other way, justified some other way, and he could not say in 1 Timothy 1.15 that he's the chief of sinners. He was not would not have been the chief of sinners save, saved as a sinner. He would have been saved as a justified person on the road to Damascus that later got saved. No. He was saved when he believed. He believed on the Damascus road. That was what changed him. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So, um, that's the complete presentation that Paul makes of the gospel of salvation, the gospel of Christ, which is also called later in, in, uh, in Acts, up, when you get to Acts 20, it's called the gospel of the grace of, uh, the gospel of the grace of God in, in Acts 20, verse 24. It's, it's the same saving message, though. All right, we'll, we'll stop there for today. Um,